So welcome everyone to the Sunday final time together as the Messy Church Canadian Conference Messy Connections. As we've come together today, it has been in the spirit of God and in the community that surrounds us. And like in all things, we begin in the presence of God. And so today to symbolize that, we light a Christ candle. And remembering that we are not alone, that we live in God's world, we begin acknowledging the land. Hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Blakey, the Member of Parliament for Elmwood Transcona and a member of Messy Church. Salut tout le monde. Je suis Daniel Blakey, le député pour Elmwood Transcona et un membre de la cathédrale Pelmel. I'm coming today from Ottawa on Parliament Hill which is on the traditional unceded territories of the Anishinaabe and the Algonquin peoples. And my riding of Elmwood Transcona in Winnipeg is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. I know people are participating in the Messy Connections Conference from across the country, and there are many, many territories uh, on which, uh, from which everyone is participating. So I'd invite you to do your own land acknowledgement in the chat so people can see all the many territories across the country from which people are participating. And I want to just take this opportunity to wish you a very good uh, Messy Connections conference and, uh, and wish you all the best. We uh, open with a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for this blessing of time that we have together and for the gifts that you give to us. Bless this time that we share that we may know your love surrounding us and calling us into your sh into shares of Christ's ministry in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, wanting to introduce you to the whole of the planning team has been easy because everybody has been willing to take a part. But if you have only watched a little bit of the conference, you haven't seen everyone. So now we're going to take time to introduce you to the Messy Church team in the words of introduction. I trust we're all here. I just need to check. I haven't seen Shannon yet. So I'll read the Shannon part. But Shannon, and when Shannon comes, <laughs> I, she might still be at church. But here we are together in God's name. We begin with Gail. What a conference this has been. We opened with Susie sharing the story stick. And as we received the gift of the story stick, Lucy wondered if God has a little cache of precious things like this for each of us, reminding God of special moments. We reflected that God brings us back home to ourselves and to our stories. And in meeting in Messy Church, we are coming to those stories in places of play. And as we thought about Messy Church gatherings and the conversations that grow and nourish faith, Lucy reminded us that all we do is cook a few things and God does the rest. Lucy said, Messy church is about coming as you are and reminded us that play is the ultimate spiritual act as it can heal and release prisoners and help us to see clearly. Lucy reminded us that we are best church when we are together with people who are different than us and we need to be disciples to make disciples. As we put on our best veneration, gloves of gratitude, socks of song and more, we told stories. And Linnea Good reminded us, a story at best is something that grows the storyteller. Songs in our hearts that we celebrate the mess of messy church. We do not have things all tidy after all. As Claire Daw said, it's often the process, not the product. And in Sandy Brodine's words, it is time to make meaning together. Welcome back, Lucy.
you have no idea how terrifying it is to have your words quoted back at you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. And um, I was really sorry to miss yesterday. It looked an amazing programme. I hope it went really well. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it did. Uh, I, I've no doubt I will hear from Carol and Gail and the others afterwards uh, what sort of a day it was. Um, but I just wanted, before I start uh, today's talk, I, I just wanted to, I suppose, a bit similar to how you acknowledge the, the land that you're on and the foundation you're standing on. I just wanted to acknowledge Carol and the team and the amazing foundation that you've all been for this conference and for Messy Church in Canada. Um, it, it is, it all sounds so cheesy, doesn't it, when you say it, but I really mean it. It's such a privilege to work with people who have this heart for God, who have this heart for families in the community, um, and who, uh, who kind of buy into the messy church values. It, it really is like being with a, a family, a tribe uh, that extends around the world. So thank you for all that you're doing um, to help God's spirit to, to find safe places all the way across Canada. A phenomenal work and, and every blessing in it. So thank you for letting me be part of it. <laughs> oh, now today, today, um, we have um, the rather glorious title of um, Living in the Mess, Living with the mess. <laughs> and I think that was you, Carol, that came up with that one. Um, but uh, yeah, a very good title. Um, and one of the things that I love about the Messy Church work is that, um, <laughs> that you can always shrug your shoulders and go, oh, it's a mess. It's messy. And, and that kind of covers over a multitude of sins. <laughs> it's rather glorious. So today we're, um, we're going to look at a rather lovely verse. We're back to Isaiah Isaiah um, 61. And Graham, if you could bring it up on, on the screen there, that would be lovely. Um, I'm not sure how clear it is on my um, my sunflower. It was my sunflower, what I did grow. I'm very proud. In previous years, the slugs have always eaten my sunflowers. And this year, I had a whole crop of sunflowers. I'm very proud. So here we go. Uh, this lovely, lovely verse from um, a really beautiful chapter. For as the soil makes the young plant come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow. So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. As the soil makes the young plant come up, a garden causes seeds to grow. So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. It's a fantastic verse to finish with, isn't it? Because if you're feeling like on top of the world and as if you could dash out and start six messy churches before breakfast tomorrow, it gives you this idea that actually the, the, the world is pregnant with possibilities and potential. And yes, you can dive in and do that thing. And if you're feeling uh, as if you're just a bit tired and overwhelmed and dismayed and exhausted by all that we've been going through with the pandemic and, and everything else and a lot of time on Zoom uh, over the weekend. Um, and now these mad people are wanting me to start a messy church as well. <laughs> then there's the truth that this work is God's. It's God's work and we can just relax and enjoy the privilege of working with God if that's what we want to do. 
but God will do what God will do regardless. Uh, and it's, so it's a lovely liberating verse to encourage us whatever we're feeling like. And, and don't you think that, that Jesus probably had this verse in mind when he told that little, that lovely little parable um, that's in Mark 4. Um, do you remember the one? It's it's not one of the better known ones because it's it's kind of, well, where's the story, please? Uh, there is no story. Where's the plot? But it's the one that goes, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces corn, first the stalk, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. As soon as the corn is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Lots of resonances there, aren't there? Then that same feeling of, oh, oh, things are growing. Things are growing. And I never knew they would. Um, what's going on? This is bizarre. Um, so <laughs> the kingdom of God uh, is like a garden. Um, Graham, I wonder if you could bring up the next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the very now familiar um, values slide. And if you remember on uh, Thursday, all that time ago, we thought about celebration, uh, that garment of praise, um, which I'm sure you've got a treasured drawing of somewhere. Um, and, oh, you won't need to draw anything today, by the way, just in case that was on your mind and worrying you. No drawing today. Um, so celebration and creativity that we looked at on Thursday. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Sandy was thinking about that as well yesterday. And we thought about um, being all age, diverse, on Friday. And so today we're thinking about hospitality. Hospitality, and uh, this will make sense later on if you're thinking, hey, what, what, gardens, hospitality, what's all that about? It will make sense, I promise you. Um, hospitality is, mm -hmm. <sighs> if I, I like all the messy church values, obviously, um, but if I had to choose a favourite, I, I really think it would be hospitality. Um, I get very, very passionate about hospitality. It's the more you look into it, the more exciting it gets and the richer it gets and the more it opens up possibilities and potential. Um, and the more I think this should be at the heart of every single church. Why are we not experts in hospitality in the entire church? We should be, it's so much part of what the kingdom of God is all about, that we should be like, we should be the hospitality industry for the world, <laughs> even though hospitality industry is a horrible, horrible phrase. Um, let, me, let me explain a little bit why. I love this, this value so much. It's something about relationship. And it's something about, um, it's something about the power in a relationship. And I think so often in the world and in the church particularly, we get power wrong and we strive for power and we abuse power. And in hospitality, there is something rather beautiful going on with power. If you think of hospitality as, as um, uh, involving two people or two groups, you've got the host who has the power, who has everything, who has the resources and the abundance and the safe space. And you've got the the guest or the stranger, perhaps, the visitor, who has nothing, who is vulnerable, who has needs. And the two are in a relationship where the person with the power has a choice of what to do. 
because they have all the strength and the, they've got somebody in their power. And the lovely thing about hospitality in the ancient world, the world of the Bible, is that hospitality was a sacred duty. It was something that mattered so much to that society that it had a deep, deep wisdom because it says something about the society, the culture, that they knew it was best to be. And that was a culture of hospitality. It was the sacredness of the guest, the sacredness of the stranger visiting you. Because, I mean, if you're a nomadic society, then frankly, you know that, all right, today you might have your safe camp and your family all around you and your camels and your sheep and your, your tents and everything. And you might be perfectly safe with your bodyguards and everything. And you can welcome a stranger into your camp. But next week, you might be the one traveling on your own across the desert. You might be the one needing the hospitality of somebody else. And so there's this interplay of power that you can have all the power at one point in your life and none of the power in the next point of your life. So it's ever changing. It's a dynamic relationship of power. And it's, as I say, it's something about the society that they wanted to be making safe spaces for strangers, making home from home making a place where somebody very vulnerable can relax and thrive and flourish, an oasis in the desert, if you like. And I just want to just stray quickly into two of my favorite stories about hospitality in the Bible. Um, because they say so much about hospitality and are so inspirational for us where we are today, as we strive to make safe spaces for spiritual journeyers, for people who are traveling through a wilderness where nobody's affirming their spirituality, where they're looking for a safe space to thrive and doubt and ask the difficult questions and find a language to put on something that they're feeling about otherness and what is this thing you call God. We're trying to make in our messy churches somewhere for the spiritual travelers to thrive, to flourish, to belong. And the first story um, is, is the story of, uh, it's an ancient one, ancient, one of the, I think it's in, is it Genesis 18? It's, it's right in the first book of the, uh, of the Bible. And if you remember, um, Abram and Sarai are, are camped out uh, by the oaks at Mamre. And it's a hot day, always a hot day, and it's after lunch and they're all having a siesta. And there they are. And, and if you remember, at this stage in the story, God has promised them that they will have this amazing family that will be greater than the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore, greater than the sand in the desert. But they have no child. There is not even one child and they're both getting older. And as, um, as they're having their, their, their postprandial siesta and Abram's an old man, He's very old, so he's enjoying his rest, no doubt. There across the desert come these three strangers, and the strangers come towards their camp. And, of course, Abram has a choice. Either he can say, I'm old, I'm having my rest, uh, I've done my bit, let one of the younger ones go out and, and sort them out. But he doesn't do that. He runs out of the camp. He throws himself down on the ground and bows down in front of these strangers. And he more or less 
drags them in, you know, invites them in so overwhelmingly positively that they, they probably had no choice. <laughs> they felt they needed to come in. Um, and he does all the things that that society says you should do for a guest. He, he washes them and he gives them, a, you know, their feet and, and he, he gets, gets the family preparing not just a little sandwich, uh, and a carton of orange juice, but they kill a whole cow and they get these masses and masses of flour to make masses and masses of bread with. And they get this yogurty drink. Um, I don't know what it was, but some sort of milky drink um, that was the best that they could offer. Um, for some reason, in my mind, I always have this vision of like donor kebabs being on offer. Uh, I don't know why that comes to me, but I always think of them eating donor kebabs uh, under the trees there. And they give them the food to eat. They watch them eat it. And after that hospitality has been offered, the three visitors somehow weirdly in the story become one. And they reiterate the promise of a child. And they say, when we come this way again, you will have a child. And that's exactly what happens out of that hospitality. It's as if Abraham and Sarai's hospitality releases a blessing, releases the promise that they needed, releases that hope of a next generation, someone to pass on your inheritance to, a hope for the future. And it's exactly what happens. And it's hospitality that's the trigger for it in that Genesis story. And I just think of our churches today where so many of us are feeling old. And we know that there's a promise, but it seems so unrealistic to think that that promise will ever be met. And all around us, the stories are of decline and lack of church attendance and no children in church and the young people aren't coming anymore and everyone's tired. And I just want to say, be hospitable. Let's be hospitable. Let's give people the best we have, the best welcome we have, the best resources that we have. Um, just like Abraham got his best cow and gave that as the meal. Let's, let's offer the best. We have lots. We're working from a place of abundance. We're God's people. and We are not lacking in anything, frankly. And let's give that up. Let's not stockpile it for a rainy day. Let's give it up. And that way... God blesses us with blessings, huge blessings. I'm convinced it's the way forward for the whole church uh, in terms of reaching the next generation. We need to look back at stories like that and say, what releases the blessing of hope and a future? So that's, that's one of the stories that I love uh, about hospitality. Do look it up because it's it's in terms of you've done a lot about storytelling over this conference and in terms of storytelling it's so beautifully written it's it's a master storyteller behind that story just wonderful um and i've missed a lot out um, lots of laughter lots of laughter um the other story which is um very key i think about hospitality is the story of zacchaeus uh, which is perhaps a, a much more familiar one to us all. And if you remember, um, Jesus is going through the city of Jericho with his disciples and there's huge crowds coming out to cheer him on. And there's this little tax collector who's an obnoxious little man uh, and he's cheated everybody. He's collaborated, collaborated with the Romans. Um, he takes a cut out of every transaction he does. Um, he's, he's just an unpleasant little man and he's little. Uh, he can't see above the crowd. And of course, nobody's going to kindly let him stand in front of them because he's so revolting. And so he climbs a tree. And you might want to think, oh, I wonder if the tree is the place of hospitality here. But I think it's actually the place that symbolizes his 
ostracism from that society. He can't even be in the crowd jostling alongside people. He's totally on the edge. And Jesus comes along in this huge crowd of people and he stops and he looks up at the one person and he says, Zacchaeus, come on down because I'm going to come and have a meal at your house today. And this shock and horror of the crowd, you can, you can only imagine, uh, but Jesus doesn't care doesn't give a monkeys he just does what he knows he needs to do and goes along to Zacchaeus's house and presumably eats it doesn't actually say that but presumably they have a meal together and at the and everybody's watching this meal remember they were very public meals in those days so everyone's kind of watching everything and listening to everything um, and at the end of the meal Zacchaeus stands up and he for some reason he says, I'm going to give away half of my belongings to the poor and anyone I've cheated, I'm going to pay them back four times as much as I stole from them. And Jesus says, salvation's come to this house today because this, <laughs> this man too is a son of Abraham. He was lost and now he's found. And it's a really fascinating story from the point of view of hospitality, isn't it? Because what you've got is that dynamism between who is the host and who is the guest. Because at first glance, it looks as if, well, it's obviously Zacchaeus is the host and Jesus is the guest in Zacchaeus's house. Zacchaeus is providing all the food um, and Jesus is eating it. Um, but actually, when you, when you look a bit further, the person with the power in that story, it's Jesus all the way. He's the one who invites himself to Zacchaeus's house. He's the one who, in something that he says or the way that he listens, perhaps, he changes Zacchaeus's life. He changes that household to a godly way of life, out of a corrupt way of life. It's Jesus who has the power. So this dynamism between who's the host, who's the guest, is beautifully portrayed in that little story. And, and the other really interesting thing is to think, who gets blessed through this hospitality? Who is blessed? In the earlier story, it was Abraham and Sarai who were blessed with their son Isaac. And interestingly, you could argue that the generations after Isaac were blessed by this beacon of light that was held by God's people over the generations. And ultimately, even now, we're blessed by Isaac and by Abraham and Sarah, because we have the blessing of the person who, <laughs> who was in their line, who was a great, 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 great grandson uh, of Jesus himself. And in the story of Zacchaeus, yes, you've got Zacchaeus, whose life is turned upside down and who obviously has got a whole new way of being. He's blessed, no question. And Jesus is blessed, <laughs> which is a lovely thought, isn't it? Jesus is probably grinning from ear to ear as he's, as he's saying that wonderful bit about salvation's come to this house today. Um, this is just what Jesus has, has come to do, uh, to rescue the lost, release the prisoners, set the captives free. But also, also, the whole community of Jericho gets blessed. <laughs> Um, they, the poor get this huge influx of cash and all those people who are suffering injustice, they've got, do I mean retribution? Restitution, that's the word I'm looking for. They've got fairness and justice and restitution and cash, which also helps. So the blessing of that meal of hospitality is just phenomenal. It's, it blossoms out from the tiny little household out into the whole community. 
And isn't it exciting when we think about the hospitality that we're offering through our messy churches, that that warm welcome at the door um, that that greets people as if they're the lost sheep being brought home uh, or the lost son coming back after his tribulations in the pig pen. That that welcome at the door, the welcome at every activity table, that that a big smile waiting. You're just, you're just so happy that this person has chosen your activity to come to and you want to make them feel as, as safe and as at home as you possibly can in your little area of hospitality. And then in the celebration, when we're, when we're welcoming people into the presence of God in, a, in an even more direct way, um, making a safe space, a safe place to wonder and to articulate and to doubt and to try out this strange thing we call worship. Um, it's, it's about creating a, 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 a home <laughs> where, you can, where you can practice things. And then, of course, there's the meal, that expression of hospitality that in that great tradition of Abraham and Sarai and those three visitors and Zacchaeus and Jesus at the Last Supper. This beautiful expression of abundance and welcome and acceptance just as you are. Um, I, it's transformative stuff that we're doing. This is not just shoving pie and peas down people's throats. This is, this is a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. This is the way that blessing is released into our whole communities. Oh, so much to think about. So much to think about. Um, now then, where am I? Oh, I know. Yes. Um, Hold all that in mind, hold all that in mind about the power of hospitality, because what we're thinking about is, is living in the mess. And um, of course, if you if you want to live in a tidy way, then the last thing you want to do is express hospitality, exercise hospitality. It's a really bad idea because inviting people, inviting strangers into your your safe environment it's it suddenly becomes very unpredictable and very messy if you're a good host and you allow people to thrive then um that's going to be messy so um if you want to stay tidy then don't do hospitality but if you want to live in the mess and live with the mess then hospitality is a great way to go and i was thinking about this creating of safe spaces, creating of homes from home. And it struck me that um, the gardening is a really brilliant image to use. And, and that's why it's lovely to have this passage from Isaiah. Isaiah, I uh, must speak Canadian, um, this passage from Isaiah to look at today, um, this idea of, of of the garden making seeds grow and young plants spring up. Um, since we moved up here to, uh, to Derbyshire, I've become very interested in wild gardening. I don't know if any of you are, are into it, um, but wild gardening is, um, is something I presume it's one of these ideas that's been around for a while, but is uh, coming to the fore now. More and more people are getting interested in it. Um, and because when we moved, <laughs> we went straight into lockdown, then um, what better thing to do uh, in all those spare hours that we would have been entertaining people, um, what better thing to do than to get the garden in the new house under control. I say under control, but the idea of wild gardening is to work with nature instead of against it. It is great because overnight you get rid of all the weeds in your garden. You don't have any weeds anymore. There are no unwanted plants anymore because suddenly you've got a garden full of wildflowers. 
<laughs> without having to do a single thing. It's fabulous. Um, and if you've got a, uh, an area like a lawn that's really, um, that's a monoculture and it's really difficult to maintain and time consuming and it takes a lot of resources, it needs a lot of watering, uh, you've got to do a lot of pulling up of dandelions and moss, raking out of moss, trimming the edges, keeping it mown down to the right height. It's a lot of work, a lot of work. But if you let it go and have a wildflower meadow instead, then suddenly you've got something that's diverse and exciting and easy to maintain. Um, there's, there's, of course, it's hard work. Wild gardening is hard work. Um, that you've got to look after things like um, the thugs of the plant world. You've got to trim off the, the seed heads of the, the dock plants uh, before they seed for the next year. So that because they're, they're, they're kind of the thugs of the, the plant world and they take over everything if, if you let them run riot. So if you want a, a balanced uh, biodiversity and you do have to do a fair amount of work to to give the the weaker plants a bit of a chance to survive um, but you also get rid of um, all the pesticides and herbicides and artificial fertilizers so the only things you put on the soil are, are homegrown compost and manure um, which is not only cheaper um, but it makes it a much safer space for uh, the, the bees and things, because the idea of wild gardening is that humanity, especially somewhere as small as Britain and as intensively occupied as Britain, you've probably got a bit more space in Canada, but you, you know, why do I say that? You've definitely got more space in Canada, but in Britain, we're very overcrowded, aren't we? And we have stolen and stampeded and built over so much of the natural world. We've stolen the habitats of the creatures who were there first. We have, um, we have been inhospitable. We have concreted over where they should be living. Um, I forget the actual figure, but it's something horrific, like 80% of the natural ponds in England have been lost over the last hundred years. It's when you think of the amphibian life that has been lost, that all these species becoming endangered because we farmed intensively and we've built too intensively. Um, so wild gardening is a way of saying, well, the little area that I have control of, my little yard, my little garden, um, I can do something about in restitution. I can do something to make my little space a hospitable space, a space that's safe for creatures to come, that's safe for life to flourish. Um, I can't do anything about <laughs> the huge uh, grouse um, kind of moors. I can't do anything about where the sheep graze. It doesn't belong to me. But the area that I can help out with is my garden. I can do what I want to do in my garden. And I'm going to make that a, a safe space for creatures and flora and fauna of all sorts. And oh, I have to tell you this because it's so exciting. And there are pictures. Graham, would you mind just flicking on to the next few uh, slides? Look, this is a view. Um, from a, a bit of my garden. It's very beautiful. This was back in March, I think, last year, uh, this year. Um, we've got a lovely dry stone wall and um, yeah, it looks out over beautiful, beautiful hills and countryside. And I thought, I'm going to build a pond. And so here we go. There, there's the start of my pond in that spot, uh, digging it all out. Um, and uh, keep going, Graham. There's a few here because I'm so proud of it. There's me with the uh, the, the lining. That's the um, that's the underlay uh, to uh, to go underneath the lining, which all needed patting down. Um, and the next one, Graham. Uh, and that was the first bucket of water going in after the lining had been put on. And I think there's one more. 
Ah, uh, yes, and there it is in all its glory with its wood piles around the edge for, for, uh, for creatures to hide in. And I planted it up with, uh, with natural um, native wild plants. Um, and, and the idea of a wildlife pond is, is that you don't stock it, really. You, you put the plants in um, to give it a head start, but you don't put fish in and you don't you're not allowed to move amphibians anyway, it's illegal. Um, but you just leave it and wait and see what happens. It's a kind of make the space and they will come theory, which is really interesting, isn't it? Um, and I'm sure you're already making the leaps in your mind about what I'm talking about and your church. Make the space and they will come. And so while I was dreaming of, of great crested newts and frogs and toads all excitedly hopping around my pond, they haven't come yet. I still live in hope, but they have not made it up the hill. I blame the hill. I can't imagine any newt being tough enough to leg it all the way to the top of our hill. But one day, maybe, maybe the newt will come. Uh, but what I have got to my amazement is snails. These snails have appeared in my pond, these huge great pond snails. They're terribly exciting. I should have taken a photo, but I can't get close enough. Um, but they're wonderful. They came out of nowhere and they sit happily on one of the plants and they just chomp away at all the algae and keep the pond healthy and oxygenated. It's all very wonderful. And I didn't buy them. They just appeared. I mean, where do snails come from? Water snails at the top of a hill where there's no other ponds around. It's amazing. They just appeared. It's very, very good. There's lots of other stuff as well, but I was most excited about the snails. Um, however, um, Graham, do show us the, the next slide um, because I, um, I have a trail cam. Paul got me a trail cam for my birthday and I set this up next to the pond. And there are some unwelcome guests as well as the welcome ones. And this is a picture of a squirrel's bottom. And I have this great, obese, fat, horrible squirrel that eats all my bird food and comes and drinks out of the pond. And frankly, I do not like the squirrel. It's a, it's a pest, it's vermin. Uh, they do terrible damage to the wildlife around here. Um, and they might look cute and cuddly, but they're basically rats with tails, with fluffy tails, and I don't like it. So there we go. The unwelcome visitors come, as well as the welcome ones, like the bats and, um, and the snails and the water beetles. <sighs> Graham, if you could just pop up the, the next slide, that would be great, because this shows, um, this is our lawn. This was, this was our lawn over the summer. And as you can see, we, we didn't mow it. We mowed a path around it and let the the grass grow in the middle and let grow what was going to grow. It was definitely leave it, make the space and it will come. Um, and it was quite phenomenal what happened, I think, in our lawn. As I say, we mowed the path around the edge, but before we knew it, there were little paths weaving their way across the meadow where something had been coming overnight and weaving its way through the long grasses. You can see it there. I like, I like to think it's a moose or a, a wildebeest, but I, I fear it's probably next door's cat. Um, but anyway, something uh, is alive and well in our garden uh, and using that space. Um, and when you leave a lawn like that, uh, in maybe especially in the countryside, lots of life happens. And Graham, if you could just flick through the next few slides, these were all taken in our garden. You get the dandelions and the bees. Um, the bees love the dandelions and, and just feasting on the nectar and resting on the dandelion clocks. And the next one, Graham, you get the, the violets in the spring, just hiding in, in the grass. If it had been mown, they wouldn't be there. You get the viper's bugloss, which has just been stuffed full of bees. It's had all, I mean, like dozens of different sorts of bees uh, and different pollinators coming. Um, 
And I think there's one more. Yes, the harebells. These beautiful, beautiful. This photo doesn't do it justice. This huge patch of these beautifully coloured harebells popped up in the lawn. And this lawn has been mown by previous vicars over the last, gosh, I mean, 100 years or so. And they, when did these harebell seeds have a chance to grow before? But they were there. They, they popped up and they, <laughs> they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. So letting things grow letting the things grow that want to grow, making safe space for these wonderful, diverse plants and flowers and creatures to flourish. It's, it's all been a great adventure for me. Um, and I look forward to next year to see what will pop up uh, when we've left it for even longer and more things have had a chance to blow in. It's a mess. That photo of the lawn, I'm quite sure that some of you were thinking, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, I could never let my yard get like that. Um, oh, dear, then what would the neighbours say? It is living with the mess, but the life that comes with that mess is phenomenal. And I hardly need to say it, but the parallels with church are, are obvious. Um, Sadly, over the years, we've, we've somehow ended up with this, ah, this longing for a, a tidy church. And I, I think we've taken that injunction of Paul's in the epistles for, for order in worship to mean that we have to sit in straight rows and we have to do as we're told. And, um, um, and we sit and we're quiet and we listen and uh, it's, it's ordered and it's tidy and it's predictable and there is no space for spontaneity for growth for um for surprises to happen um and if a the equivalent of a dandelion reared its head in a service and interrupted the beautiful uh, calm green of the lawn then there'd be someone along very quickly to dig it out by the root and our structures mean we need structures. We talked about it the other day with the trellis on the vine. We need structures, but our structures sometimes get so rigid and so inflexible that we can't think of new things. And the pandemic, for all its agonies and its trauma, did give us, has given us a once in a lifetime chance to think, how can we do things differently? Do we want to go back to how it was before? And what I see in the UK, in the UK church, is a little bit tragic because so many of us have just gone straight back as quickly as possible to how things were before because we haven't taken the space to think, gosh, if we just let our church go wild for a bit, if we sat and waited to see what the Holy Spirit blows in, would that be okay? But instead, a bit like hosts who want things to be their way, we've said, no, we're going to do things how we've always done them uh, and get them going again um, as quickly as possible. It, it was brought home to me when my husband Paul went to a, a churches together meeting down in the village with the other church leaders in the area. And he said that he came away disappointed because all the time on the agenda was given to the plans and rotors for doing all the things that we used to do pre-pandemic. And there was absolutely no time to sit together as church leaders and imagine what new things we might want to do and what old things we might want to let go of. There was no space made for the creativity uh, to be church for today. So in a wild garden, you, you get rid of the hazards, you get rid of the pesticides, the ne neonicotinoids and things, and you make a space where wild creatures want to come and where they'll be safe when they do come. 
in messy church, perhaps we could see ourselves as removing the hazards that threaten people's spirituality. <laughs> and it would be a great way of making your messy church even better, taking it in new directions. Um, all the things that cramp people's style, the, that make them not flourish, the things like being told off for making a noise, for expressing doubt or disagreement, um, the inappropriate language or liturgy, unrealistic expectations that we put on people, all these things, all these negative things that come about with organised religions that might make a new person just shrivel up and stop thriving or just take quietly take themselves elsewhere. Instead, we try and create a hospitable space with perhaps few expectations on people, but masses of opportunities that we offer them. We provide the equivalent of, of pollen-rich flowers, where the equivalent of bees will want to come and will fly away with their, their little sacks filled with pollen to go and fill up their honeycombs, which will bless people that we've never even met. <laughs> We won't taste that honey, but other people will. And we have to accept that when we are hospitable, there will be unwelcome visitors like that fat, that really fat squirrel, which frankly could do with a bit of exercise running up and down the hill, uh, going to get its water elsewhere. We're going to get some unwelcome visitors, um, people who are just having a laugh people who are uh, taking what they can get, people who are just going to come, take and go. But that's all part of what hospitality is about, um, the benefits of being a hospitable community far outweigh any exploitation that those few exploitative guests are going to inflict on us. And in messy church, it's all okay. <laughs> um, that, that byline, it's messy. It, it's, it applies in this situation as in most others. Uh, what matters is providing a safe space where the spirituality of every person, young and old, can flourish and grow like that vine. This conference has been a place of sowing seeds. It's I hope been a place where the young plants are growing. Um, so whether you're starting a messy church or, or whether you're, you're running a messy church already, I hope it's been a place that's, that's welcomed you and that's been a really rich kind of pollen laden environment um, that sends you out to your part of Canada uh, with your honey sacks, your pollen sacks kind of laden with stuff to take back to your own hive. Um, that wonderful passage from Isaiah, I'll, I'll just read it again to finish because it's so beautiful and something to take into the rest of our year. For as the soil makes the young plant come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Amen. And let the people say, Amen. Lucy, how do we thank you? Um, it's been tremendous. It's really been tremendous. And I'm going to flip to the uh, other gallery view so I get to see. Uh, amen. I see a, a few amens. Thank you, Lucy. Um, we have a couple of minutes before we, we close in prayer for anyone who would like to have a comment or uh, and uh, well, welcome back, Mary. I hope you got to hear a, a word or two of this wonderful uh, message uh, from, from Lucy. Um, I love that image of let us be 
pollen rich flowers. I love that image. And I also love that image of we may not taste the honey, but someone else will. You know, um, we may not see the blessing in our in our own communities, but the the blessing far beyond that will be uh, sensational. So um, wonderful to have you here.